every day that I stepped on the basketball court, even though I was on top of the world, I felt like I had something to prove. After Michael Jordan's final season, the NBA gave him yet another Most Valuable Player award and said the reason is simple. After 13 seasons, you still go out every night and play like Michael Jordan. When Jordan would go out for the spotlight introduction, he would look up into the stands and he would realize that there was at least someone up there that night who had never seen him before We've never seen him again. And this would be the one Michael Jordan moment they ever had. And he would say he was playing for those people there. We had a six game road trip. Michael had had some spasms in his lower back. And we literally had to, you know, carry him um, off the bus, off the plane, to the bus, from the bus to the hotel. You know, it amazed me. He went out and got 40 points that night. This is the kind of player he was. He wanted everybody to see his special skill, and he didn't want people that love basketball not to have that opportunity. When the playoffs began, in his heart, Michael already knew that these would be his last games. But this would be no nostalgic farewell tour. He was determined to go out on his own terms as a champion. The Bulls' first round opponents were the New Jersey Nets, young and full of hope. Michael was dominant. It was a three game sweep, built on mental toughness as much as physical talent. And for Michael, the way to develop the mind had always been through the heart. A lot of parents are asking me, well, what advice would you give my kids? And my advice would be, let them just enjoy the game. I think what they have to learn more about at the young age is their love for the game. And once they develop that, then the, the mental part is easy. I didn't really get instruction until I was a junior in high school. First, I just loved the game, and I let my skills develop. So I believe in, in learning late, playing early, but learning late. Michael's love of the game was born in his hometown of Wilmington, North Carolina, during long afternoons on the playground. His older brother Larry helped Michael hone his game in their epic battles of one-on-one -on -one at their backyard hoop. But Michael's first hard lesson would come when he tried out for the varsity team at Laney High. When I was a sophomore in high school, like most high school kids, you get all the energy and all the, the motivation and excitement of making your varsity team, which is a big thing. Status is a lot when you're in high school. So you can imagine the disappointment that I got when I felt like I should have made the team, but then didn't make the team. I'm crying, 
I lost my emotions totally. My mother came to me and said, use that energy to prove to the coach and to your peers and your classmates that they made a mistake. You give it your best. You try so hard and you get to the point, I know I can't do it. And if you try one more time, you're able to achieve it. It's going one step further. That's not giving up. It's giving your best. I only will walk away when I know I do not have anything else to give. The disappointment was so deep, like a cut. It struck the fire in me to make sure that I never endure that type of pain again. In the second round of the playoffs, Michael returned home with a vengeance. Playing the Charlotte Hornets, it would be Michael's last professional appearance in North Carolina. It's always been a treat to come back home when you are growing up here and you go out, and become a man on your own, and then come back home to show what's evolved in that person. For fans who had watched him since his days as a Carolina schoolboy, what emerged now was not just the skill but the willpower. Those who remembered his raw potential now saw the results of a lifetime of hard work. He would go to JV practice and practice and then he'd go to Boston practice. We'd play ball games and after games were over, he'd run uh, what we call suicides or line drills. He'd run those by himself. I just marveled at his work habits even then. With his competitiveness, uh, to go with all that dedication, uh, you know, it was something to see. The weakest part of Michael's game on the offensive end was his shooting. So he obviously mastered something that everybody said he couldn't do when he came out of college. And he did it by shooting, 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 and shooting consistently. The other thing that people told him that he wasn't a really good defensive player. And he found a way to not only become a great defensive player, but the best defensive player in the NBA. This guy said, those are my weaknesses. I'm going to figure out how to make those my strengths. And he did it. I got a glimpse, really, of Michael Jordan and what he was all about the first time I ever coached him. About two minutes to go in the game, I called a timeout. We were down two. It was, it was right there in the balance. And I had some little powder on my mouth from where I chewed some gum and chewed it so hard that it really become powder. And Michael grabbed a cup of water and he handed it to me and he said, take a drink of this water, clear that stuff off your mouth. I'm not gonna let you lose your first game. The level of faith that I have in anything in life is taught to you from your parents. It is the trait that I would never trade anything for. And if I can ever pass anything on to my kids, it would be, op be optimistic about everything in life. He was only a freshman at the University of North Carolina, but with the 1982 NCAA championship at stake, his team's fate was in his hands, and he never hesitated. Goes back to Michael Jordan, jumper from out on the left. The Star Eagles are going to win the national championship. After I hit the shot, my father came to me and said, this was the start of something big. He didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was, but I did believe him. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Flight 23. Please make sure your seatbelts are securely fastened and extinguish all smoking materials. really was occurring and an explosion in media was occurring and and he helped drive that explosion yo mike what makes you the best player in the universe is it the haircut no more is it the shoes there's been so many things that he's popularized the shorts the shoes must be the shoes money's gotta be the shoes 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 i think michael's transcended every boundary of gender and 
race and age and sport. I think he's become a sort of a part of our everyday culture. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I think what made him so special as a marketing icon is that he was natural. Today, when everyone really tries to be like Mike, they're trying so hard to invent a persona. I think that people see through that and it doesn't stand the test of time. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to Bulls basketball, playoff basketball, as we move to the Eastern Conference Finals, the Bulls and the Indiana Pacers. These two teams were 2-2 two and two in the regular season, but the rivalry really begins on a Sunday afternoon in Chicago. Miller and Jordan and a cast of characters that is not afraid to win. Here's Michael. Slips and falls down, gets back up into the lane, hops through, falls, fires on the rim, and it's gone. The Indiana Pacers, with their outside shooting and physical play, were a team custom-built to defeat Michael and the Bulls. In the first two games of the series, even though the Bulls would win both games, it was clear that the Pacers would pose their first real test. games the scene shifted to Indiana. On their home court, the Pacers would win game three behind their tireless guard, Reggie Miller. Lead pass ahead for Mark Jackson. This is what Indiana wants. They run to Miller for three. Got it. In game four, the Bulls led by a point in the final seconds when Miller and Jordan would square off again. Here we go. McKee holding, looking. Here comes Miller to the top. Miller a catch. Miller a look. He hit it. Reggie Miller knocked it down. Four tenths of a second left. Tony out near the timeline. Looking, 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 looking. He got it to Michael. the board and spun out and Indiana wins the game. With a series tied at two, fatigue was taking its toll on the Bulls. And meanwhile out west, the Utah Jazz were rolling towards the finals. Led by future Hall of Famers Carl Malone and John Stockton, the Jazz dominated the Western Conference playoffs and would have 10 days rest while the Bulls and Pacers continued to battle in the east. The Bulls lost another game and would have to go the full seven in a series for the first time in years. By the end of game six, doubters were saying that Michael was finally running on empty. Bulls trail by two. Here we go. MJ one-on-one -on -one with McKee. Michael a drive, tripped off his feet, and McKee stole the ball, and that's going to do it. That will do it. Indiana's going to win it. You know, he may have been devastated that night, and I assume he was. But he had the ability to believe that we were going to win and he was going to do well. Probably one of the most remarkable shots that everybody remembers is the shot he made against Cleveland. The inbounds pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line. A shot on Elo. Good! The Bulls win! They win! But they don't remember that the night before he missed three out of six foul shots that would have sealed the game for us. And we wouldn't have had to go to the fifth game. A normal player would have said, oh, it cost us this opportunity, probably beat themselves up over it. Michael, the next day that uh, we played Cleveland, got on the bus and said, have no fear, we're going to win this ball game. 
If we sit here and worry about what people think of us, then we don't have a chance. You still got to come to Chicago. Utah, Indiana, they still got to come to Chicago. I don't care what happens today or what happened in the other series. You know, still got to come to Chicago. We will win game seven. Indiana, the ball, Michael Estill. MJ on the run, he will take the ball. Michael was facing the ultimate elimination, lose and end his career on a note of defeat. Despite Michael's promises, the Pacers led by 13 points early on. Then Michael led the Bulls on a furious rally. Circles, he's loose, driving and dunks the ball and a foul. It was the kind of run that had led the Bulls to their five previous championships. But there was still a half of basketball to play. Here we were in the conference finals. In the seventh game, we were down going into the fourth quarter. And uh, I thought, maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe we've had the last hurrah. But uh, something rose up in these players, led by our hero. He's the type of man that could get you to jump off a bridge, or at least think about it for a few seconds. He has such a will to accomplish a mission that everyone follows him. back to the top and now the switch made back by McKee. Michael to the lane, dumped out to Luke, 17 footer back, down the wall it goes. MJ on the run to Kerr for three, Kerr! MJ, ball away, jumper, shot is good, and a foul! They may have had tired legs, but Michael and the Bulls grew stronger in the game's final minutes. Bulls win, 88-83. They go to the finals again. Michael, you're a tired man, aren't you? I'm exhausted. But that's what it took to get to where we have to go. I mean, everybody had to leave it on the floor and there's no tomorrow. It's the last dance, so we got to give everything we got. You're rest. They're rested. You guys are fatigued, but I know you'll be ready to play on Wednesday. Our hearts are not fatigued. That's the most important thing. All right, Michael, great job. Before making his final exit, Michael had to take one more walk through the spotlight. If you walk through a crowd with Jordan, you see the same thing he sees. You see all the eyes aiming in. And I asked, what do you see in the crowd? And he said, sometimes I'll see a father and a son. They may not think I've even noticed them. But sometimes Jordan would say, I wonder if they have any idea how much I'd like to be them. Last night, we began the show with the disappearance of Michael Jordan's father. Right? The worst fears have come true. James Jordan was found dead victim of an apparent murder. When my father died, I had him for 32 years. I was very lucky. Yeah. I looked at it as being lucky, not as being disappointed that he wasn't around anymore. I was lucky that he was there when I needed him, that he could influence my life to look at situations that I use to help make my decisions to this day. Some kids never have that. Sure, I would love to have him now, but 
People are put on this earth for a reason, and you, you utilize the time that you're here. You never know when that's going to be taken away from you. That's one thing he taught me. But why he's here, why they're here, they should make an impact on someone's life. And he made an impact on my life. That's what, that's what bring him into this world. After the third championship, my father kept kind of hinting towards me playing baseball. Stop playing basketball. Why don't you give your baseball uh, a shot? Because that's what he actually got me started playing. When I was six years old, I played baseball. And he felt that I could play baseball and do it with the same conviction and attitude that I played basketball. Every day, the first person there before the sun would be Jordan. And he was there because he wasn't good. He would work with a batting instructor and work all day long and be the last person to leave every night also. All right, three. Money's no stand usual. But he's trying. Say hey, he's no Willie Mays. But he's trying, man. What it did teach me was don't be afraid to try. The worst thing that can happen is it doesn't, it doesn't pan out the way that you envision it. But at least you know that by giving it a shot. People were, were basically saying that I didn't have no reason to be in, in the sport, and I was degrading the sport. When those negative things started to happen, the only thing, I, I wish my father was there to give me the positive reinforcements that I needed. I asked him what it was like for him in the morning, and Jordan said, I get up before the sun comes up, and I make myself some breakfast by myself. He was down there alone. And I get in the car, and I'm driving to spring training, and there's no one really out on the roads yet. And I look at the seat next to me, and I see my dad. And I talk to him. I think to myself, Pops, we're doing this. We're doing this together. And the day would end, and he would say to the batting instructor, can we do a little more? I think I'm getting this. I think I'm learning this. I think I'm getting this. And that's when Sports Illustrated put him on the cover saying that Michael Jordan is embarrassed baseball. And as I would watch him there every night as the sun was going down and the other ball players had left, and I would see this guy working to get better, Michael Jordan working to get better, I couldn't help thinking that if you ever have children, you ought to pray that they grow up someday to embarrass you like this. Michael Jordan. I think that experience itself kind of gave him a blessing of coming back to basketball and understanding the gift that he'd been given for this game that was so special. By the hand of the Almighty, we flowered in this generation, triumphantly, won't you help to say these songs of when Michael came back and Judd and I were driving down to the game and I said, Judd, you know, does Bill start, Michael? I mean, he hasn't been here for, you know, 60 games, 65 games. And Judd looked at me and he said, Steve, as a general rule, when you have your own statue outside the stadium, you don't come off the bench. <laughs> There'll be other great players, no question about that. but. Uh, what he's done for the game, I don't think anybody will touch his greatness. And that's why everybody's holding on here in the finish to just be a part of, if this is the last run, everybody wants to be a part of it and witness it. The Bulls had gone to the finals five times, and five times they had won. The fact that this might be Michael's last chance made these finals the most anticipated ever. The Jazz had earned the home court advantage on the strength of their regular season. And now the world tuned in to see if Michael could beat the odds and win one last time. Michael Jordan is very good. Michael Jordan is going to be a good player. Right here, right
Michael circles, spins, hangs, fires, scores. In game one, the Bulls took the Jazz into Overton. But in the end, fresher legs prevailed. The previous year, although Utah had lost, they had proven to themselves that they could play with the Bulls. And then they win game one. I thought Utah was going to be the NBA champions. When everybody, in some ways, didn't expect you to win, and the odds were stacked against you. And for once in your life, you were the underdog. You know, that was, that was beautiful for me. When he needed it most, Michael didn't find comfort in the championship banners he helped raise, but rather strength from the seven years of defeat that came before. Well, it was a long road. It kept me in the gyms in the summer, working on my skills, trying to be the best basketball player I could become. But at the same time, to show players who were not on the same level with the same mental toughness, that if I'm gonna do this, then you have to keep up with the pace. And quietly, it started to turn. He was the hardest worker. He competed every day. That filtered down through your team. So as a coach, you never had to talk about the work ethic of your team because your best player always brought that. Michael's standards were too high for many of his early teammates. But then came Scottie Pippen. The influence of Michael on Scottie Pippen was almost from day one. Michael kind of helped him get out there on the basketball court and taught him some little things, some of the, the uh, small tricks that he used. As a consequence, the two of them really played well together. It was a you know, Lone Ranger and Tonto. There's no doubt about it. Pippen became a star in his own right. And then there was the supporting cast that Michael would challenge relentlessly, knowing that they too had to be ready when their moment came. He understood the fact that everybody had to share in the game and that he was willing to be part of this to sacrifice some of his own game for that was the most important thing. He comes up, I'll be ready. I've gotten a chance to play a lot and play a lot in big games. And uh, I felt the pressure, I think, and, and didn't perform that well. And I learned how to play with Michael and how to hit big shots and, and how to relax myself in situations like that. Michael in traffic to curl, 15 foot of what a great experience, you know, to, to go through, not just for basketball, but for the rest of my life. To, to know that I can face something that's pretty difficult and, and deal with it. Back in Utah, the buzz was still about the Jazz's series open. But by the time game two had begun, game one was history to Michael and the Bulls. If Michael enjoyed being the underdog, he never let his team feel like one, driving them forward with the flair and confidence of a champion. The Bulls won game two, and now the series would move to Chicago, tied at one. I have to see someone beat Michael Jordan four times because I, I said to do that, you're gonna have to dismember him. You're gonna have to take an arm and a leg and you're gonna have to drag him off the floor. He's not gonna go easily. These would be Michael's last games in Chicago, and game three played out like a thank you note to the fans. Chicago's 96-54 win in Game 3 was the biggest route in NBA Finals history. The Bulls were two games away from the title. People have said a lot of things about our physical tiredness, but our mental toughness is, is there, and I don't think that should ever be overlooked. Okay, here we go. After dominating Game 3, the Bulls' physical resilience would be tested in Game 4. Scotty, 
Looks, dumps it to Michael. MJ. Yeah, it turns baseline. Ball away. Jumper gone. Boy, what a rainbow that was. Kukoc dropped to Michael. MJ spins along the baseline. Goes up and scores. And Kukoc looking, looking, looking. Loop to Michael. He catches. Two dribbles. Spins in. Scoops and scores. Another win for the Bulls. The countdown to the championship had reached one. Now we're in the driver's seat right now, and uh, you know we just have to come out ready to play next game and you know, try to put it away. Before Game Five, the celebration had already begun. I said, "Come on, baby, don't you want to go back to the same old place, sweet home?" How big does that look on IMAX? Does that look like a gigantic bucket of popcorn on an IMAX screen? It's a whole mountain of it, folks. Come on, man. Put everything on the court. Put the heart, put on the basketball court. When we come out of the court, we all celebrate, and, and Joe's going to be happy. <laughs> Let's go, baby. Before there was anything to really celebrate, Carl Malone and the Jazz found an answer to every move the Bulls made. In Game 5, the Bulls came up empty and Michael walked out of the United Center for the last time. Back in Utah for practice the following day, the defeat was already forgotten. For here was another secret to the spell Michael had held over the rest of the league ever since his first championship. Even when the Bulls weren't superior physically, they had a philosophical edge. I think Phil had a lot to do with that. With his Zen practice, uh, his whole emotional approach to a game of basketball. I've experienced a lot of different coaches, but he gave me the understanding about life in a whole different frame. I think his teachings or the understanding of Zen Buddhism is how you view yourself to deal with the realities of life surrounding you and somehow be able to correlate that to a simple game as basketball. This is something that we talked about a lot as a basketball team is about how to be in the moment, being able to visualize what might happen in those times. Michael so embraced this, and I think that was the beauty of his game is that he had all these abilities to adjust, not force his own predetermined idea, but allow those things to come together for his game. I tend to be calm, things tend to slow down. As I go into situations that people don't know the outcome, I've already experienced them in my mind, just playing tricks with myself. So it didn't seem new to me, and I wasn't afraid to fail with it. Once I began to understand that, I became a master of the game of basketball. Game six in Utah. For the Bulls, a win would mean a championship. For Michael, it would mean the cementing of his legacy. Harp looking left, not their backdoor lob. Michael goes up and scores. The Bulls were still feeling the effects of game five as a bad back grounded Scottie Pippen. Pippen knocked down and he's struggling to get back up. That's a screen. Michael hangs in the air. His jumper gone. In Chicago, fans filled Michael Jordan's restaurant. And 23,000 of the faithful filled the United Center. Back in Utah, Michael was operating on his own. 
the celebrated teamwork of the Jazz was clicking, and Carl Malone and John Stockton took charge of the game. After a grueling postseason, the Bulls could no longer match up with the Jazz man for man. With a fourth quarter lead, the Utah crowd sensed victory drawing closer with every basket. For the Bulls, the last man standing clawed his way back into the game. Seven on the shot clock, six, five. Now Michael's got to do it himself. Jordan backing, backing, pumping, rolling, firing, scores, and a foul. Oh, oh, Three. He had played nearly every minute of the game and scored more than half of his team's points. But late in the fourth quarter, Michael finally seemed worn out by his efforts and his shots faltered. Still, Michael kept coming, kept shooting, kept getting to the line, kept the Bulls in the game. as if everything he had ever accomplished had led Michael to this one moment. And in the final minute of the game, at the final minute of his career, he would need everything he had learned along the way. Pippen looking, dumped to Michael near the timeline. MJ and Russell, Michael a drive, and the layup is good! A driving layup by Michael, draws the Bulls to win the one, 86-85. Now you got a chance for a stop here. Dennis and Carl is going to get down to the post, and they're going to do all their little necessary banging. And myself, I, I focused on Carl. Hornacek screens across. Malone to the post. While he's fighting with Dennis, he's, he, he basically forgets where the ball is. And so I choose this opportune time to make my steal and I came back to strip the ball away. Malone stripped by Michael to the floor stolen by MJ. Michael a steal. 16 seconds left. Bulls down one. Crowd gets quiet. The moment starts to become the moment, you know, for me. Once you get in the moment, you know when you're there. And when I saw the moment, the opportunity to take advantage of it, I never doubted myself. Knowing that this was going to be the last opportunity you know, to either win the game or lose it. Michael against Russell. 11, 10, Jordan. Jordan a drive. Hangs. Fire. Yes! Bulls win the title. The Bulls are the world champs again. If that's the last image of Michael Jordan. How magnificent is it?
Michael Jordan's legacy is authenticity. If you remove all the hype, all the marketing, all the Showtime glitz, he would be as 100% genuine as anybody who ever played in a gym or an armory anywhere, anytime. There's never been a player that's had that ability that Michael Jordan's had in the kind of way he did it uh, in this game of basketball. His legacy is a newborn child 10 years from now, and a father says, I wish you could have seen Michael Jordan. The dignity and grace with which you conduct yourself off the court, those are important things, and I believe those are enduring things. You figure they've been, I don't know, 25,000 years. I don't know how you do the math of that, but that's like out of all the 50,000 top athletes since, you know, Prehistoric time, brontosauruses and pterodactyls included, he's right there. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what I hear people saying, or I would want people to say, and it's simple, that if Michael Jordan was still playing the game of basketball, he would dominate. Welcome to my world, where I can No matter what happens you know, in this business of basketball, if you didn't get paid a dime, you still would play the game of basketball somewhere. Somewhere there's a kid working. He won't skip any steps. He will learn from my example just as I've learned from others. There will be a player greater than me.